This is the Other 22 Hours Podcast. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron schaefer Hayes, And I'm your host, Michaela Ann. And since this show is brand new, I assume you're a new listener. So thank you for checking us out. We like to think of this show as the anti-album cycle show. So what that means is it's not your typical musical show where guests come on and talk about their latest album or their tour. We decided to call it The Other 22 Hours because we wanted to focus on the hours that were not on stage and explore different tools and routines that our guests use to keep balance and inspiration during the less shiny times. Aaron and I have almost 25 years of touring experience between the two of us. I've spent the better part of the last decade putting out records both on my own as well as with labels, touring the world, and building an independent career. And I started making records with friends in high school and spent years on the road with a ton of different bands, and now I produce records and write music for TV and ads. Essentially, Mikhail and I are lifers, and through all this, we've learned that there's no one right way to build a career around your passion. And in an industry where so much feels out of our control and up to luck, being in the right place at the right time, and who you know, we wanted to focus on what is within our control. So with that in mind, we decided to invite our friends to have a conversation about all the other times outside of the public eye and ask them the question, what do you do to create sustainability in your life so you can sustain creating? Today's guests are a personal favorite of mine, Shovels and Rope, a band from Charleston, South Carolina. They've been putting out records together since 2008. They both had solo careers before that. Over the years, they've put out nine records, including their Busted Jukebox series. Which is a cool series of collaborations with artists such as Lucius, Brandy Carlisle, and Sharon Van Netten, and guests on this podcast, the Milk Carton Kids. They also founded and curated a food and music festival in Charleston that happens every April. It's called High Water Fest and features a ton of great bands every year. Collaboration is a really big part of what they do, and they are great community builders And we talked a lot about that. They happen to be married, they have children, and it was a really unique experience for us because we're in the same boat. And so we got to talk about things like building a schedule at home. The benefits of therapy to help communicate as partners who are raising children and working together. Carrie Ann and I multiple times asked if we happen to marry the same man. Check. (laughs) Yeah, and to top it off, we had this conversation in a really unique place. We were on board the Norwegian Pearl cruise ship during the Kayamo Festival in this really ornate dining room that looked like it was straight off the Titanic. Out at sea. Yeah, somewhere in the Caribbean between Tortola and Miami. And because of that, it was just too much to record video. So this will be an audio-only podcast. And without further ado, here's our conversation with Shovels and Rope. Well, hi. Thank you so much for carving out time with us on this ship. It's so, nice to hang out with you guys. It's a yeah, highlight. I'm excited to talk to you. There's a lot I want to. There's a lot I want to talk to you about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for listeners, we're on Kayamo, a festival on a cruise ship, and we're very excited to have shovels and rope, Carrie Ann and Michael. So you guys have been in music for a long time. Had solo careers before you started working together. I would imagine you have a wealth of knowledge of how you navigate the ups and downs of all of that in your current life. What are the ways that you guys kind of try remembering that this is all about you guys being able to create and how do you care for yourselves individually and as a family to be able to keep doing that? That is a solid question. That's going to take a lot of unpacking. There's a lot to (laughs) unpack. Yeah. And I think since having the children especially since the experience of the covid lockdown where there was just so much time the time that we are able to spend with them and we just have created more time and more intentional time we're always together always 24 7 but there's like just when we're traveling we've been more careful about making more not traveling time just Mm -hmm. to be having a really regimented kind of home life, not bouncing on tour and off tour constantly. There's like bigger tours and bigger gaps in between them. And we also have kind of a schedule when we're not working where we give each other hours, like here's your business hours. Here's where you're on point with the kids. That's how we more or less started out. We hit a wall when our daughter was, you know, new and we had one baby and we were like getting frustrated because we couldn't, You know, we both work from home and we're both taking care of Louie and we didn't know how to create any time to be creative, you know, and do the thing that makes you feel like you. And so we we did CBS Saturday morning Mm -hmm. TV show and we brought Louie with us. 
she was very young, you know, still nursing, still, you know, crazy nights. Mm -hmm. And we all stayed in the same hotel. We were just stupid, you know, like part of us was like, no, she's too little to stay overnight with the nanny. She's got to stay in the room with us. And she just had a horrible night. And we all, nobody slept. We were just like real grumpy. And we got up the next morning and we were a mess, you know, and we had to go do the show. Carrie, when she gets tired, she gets real, you know, zippy and wired. And I get just more grumpy. And then her zippy wiredness makes me kind of mad. We become intensely (laughs) incompatible at that point. Yeah. Sounds familiar. but, (laughs) But we're at the TV station studio you know in a little holding cell with our publicist who's talking about all the you know all the stuff and we're just like it carries you know pleasing uh, everybody (laughs) making sure everybody likes her (laughs) is that really is Um, it good (laughs) i was just like we were both dying because we're so tired and then you have to go on tv and do the thing oh my god and we i don't even remember it i remember that i feel like we suck i felt like I was like, didn't even have time to look in the mirror in the morning before we had to be, you know, camera ready and all that stuff. And we did it. It felt bad. You know, I think we pulled it off, but I don't know. <laughs> we better go back. I ain't going back, back looking at that. I don't go back. What happened in the past is in the past and on YouTube. We went back to the hotel <laughs> and I immediately hit up my buddy and was like, I think we need to go see a therapist. Like yeah. you were telling me about a therapist, a really great friend in Charleston and And he was like, yeah, I'll hook you up. And we got the contact. And then we started going to therapy. She helped us out with some scheduling tips. You know, it was like she was just like this person who could zoom out and say, well, why don't Michael, you give Carrie from like eight to nine in the morning to do her wellness routine, you know, whatever she wants to do, if she wants to exercise, if she wants to just like go outside or just, you know, you just be the parent on duty Mm -hmm. and then you can switch and you can have your exercise time or your wellness time, Mm -hmm. meditate, you know, cry, do whatever you need to do. Yeah. And then, you know, and then from 11 to one, somebody is the main parent and, you know, we just sort of broke up the days like that. And it really, I mean, it saved us. We that still can thing. revert to that when we come off the road and things are not on schedule. We just be like, okay, let's break this day up into what amounts to shifts, A, B, divide and conquer. Like I'm on kids while you're in the studio writing songs. You're on kids while I'm doing all the things that I do. And honestly, it's an interesting thing. Like in the studio world, Michael runs the studio. Mm -hmm. He is the director, the musical director, the producer, the arranger. And a lot of that's by choice. It's not something I'm interested in. It's not where my strengths lie. I prefer to be in the domestic end of things. I prefer to be kind of doing a lot of the mental housework so that we kind of like divided up our chores too. Like those lists of chores have changed and evolved over time. It's like Michael will always take out the garbage. I never have to put that on my calendar. I don't exact have, same thing in our house. <laughs> I don't have to do it. Laundry was kind of my world. And then I got overwhelmed with the laundry and he like scooped up laundry and became like, I actually like laundry. (laughs) And now I have a way of folding that is my way of folding and everything is organized and I know where they go in the drawers, which is empowering for him. Yeah, Yeah. it just makes the day flow a little bit easier. And it's like meditative. I don't know. I kind of like to be up there and you just rip a podcast and fold some laundry and... This is you hilarious. Know. Me time, yo, a little bit. This like is hilarious because we've been together 15 years and I still don't know how to fold t-shirts the way Aaron likes to I fold I got my t-shirts. way. They, they fit in my drawer a specific way. If you don't fold it that way, it doesn't fit. I get it. But get for it. me, it, dishes are my thing where I'll just like zone out on doing dishes and mm-hmm. I'm in my zone. And mm-hmm. It is. It's like a meditation. I yeah. Can kind of like. And then I come in and load the dishwasher and he's like, what the fuck did you do to the dishwasher? (laughs) These don't go here. (laughs) We have completely two different ways of loading the dishwasher. But you know what? I have the grace. I've decided Michael is doing the dishes. I don't have to ask him to do the dishes. This is not an issue in my marriage. It is an issue in so Mm -hmm. many marriages. Like we're two stay at home parents who bear almost equal halves of the domestic load. Mm -hmm. Probably have more of the floating stuff like he just learned to make cinnamon toast on de- like on demand man has many culinary yeah. skills but now that he has the the cinnamon toast routine down it's just one more thing that he can do if i die first mm-hmm. he's got it <laughs> he's got this so like when you guys carved out a schedule for being home did that improve your creativity and your headspace to create or did it feel like boxing it in 
you know, because like but, a lot of times I feel like having like such a regimented routine, it's almost like being creative on demand and not, doesn't that's work That's what everybody. our therapist said. She was like, listen to what you just said. I need to schedule time to be creative, which is really foreign to, I think, a lot of creative people and the way that their brains are because they just, you know, a little bit more floaty. I am like an organized creative person, so I kind of relish it. And I actually mm-hmm. will get in there and even if I don't, come up with anything I like it enjoy splattering the paint a little bit you know Mm -hmm. that kind of fills me up I think that anybody really that actually has some focus creative time and they manage it I think you'd be surprised at what you accomplish and you're like oh it's only been an hour and I have written a verse and a chorus just because I gave myself the time and space and quiet to be with my brain you know yeah Yeah. exactly yeah I don't know if you guys were 20 months into having our first kid and I'm like what did I do before? I felt really busy before. Totally. You get but real like, selfish with your time and you yeah. feel a little bit like you're, I mean, Michael has a lyric about you're feeling robbed of it, but they're your children and you love them and they have your time, mm-hmm. but it's all of it. It's all of yourself. Yeah. And you're like, can I have like 5% of myself Yeah, just so that I can like be me? But they do. They need, they need all that you have. And because you love them and you're new at it, you give them all that you have. I remember when I first started changing diapers, one little line, one little t- shallow little line of a diaper changed 12, 20 diapers a day. When it turns blue. At the line, when the line turns blue, you can give it a few more goes of pee, for example. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you're still a yeah. really good mom if you don't have to run and change that TV yeah. diaper the very second that it happens. They're made to They're made withhold. For, for 12 hours overnight sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they yeah. can go. Have you it. ever put one in a swimming pool? Have you seen what happens to it? <laughs> the science. Yeah. And that difference things. is like when your body kind of relaxes. Because I feel like since our daughter has been born, like my body's just on edge all the time because you're always like okay what does she need what does she need what 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 and also watching that she's safe and what she touching and who's she bothering and like it takes up all of your real estate right now and then that will get easier with time and there's different things that are rascally but that part I remember the 100% bandwidth devoted to just the safety and well-being of the child and some of the old timers fuss at you like you're hovering over that baby you're picking that baby up too much you're but they don't remember what it's like to have something depend on you for every single thing that it needs in the world. It's all mm-hmm. it does is breathe on its own and its heart beats. That's on uh, you. It's yeah. on you. Mm-hmm. And if, if something goes wrong, it's on you. Mm-hmm. And there are legal liabilities for doing a terrible job. <laughs> you know, it's not just between you and God. It's between you and the law. If you mess up too bad, you got to get it. So did you, so Michael said that he thrives from the schedule, but you said you find it both ways. It's both ways. We both read a book that was informative and I was like man really I gotta that's what I gotta do and Michael was like I knew it I knew that that's what we were supposed to do I've been doing that it was, was it the first Jeff Tweedy book that, oh yeah and he talks a lot about when you're young and you're free and you don't have any responsibilities and you're selfish and you're only thinking of your creativity all those ideas come from the ether and you're just grabbing stuff and humming things and and you just think that songs come through you like you're some kind of conduit for something mm-hmm. and then when you have to budget your time this is the conduit and you're not available to create anything unless you've created the space and the time for you to create that. I will very quickly fill up that designated space with frivolous activities that have nothing to do with creativity. So it mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily yield art for me yet. And sometimes it does. And it's just because I'm a bad time manager, which is why I have been interested in what you've been posting on Instagram. I've been laughing. <laughs> and I was like, this is the sleeper that's going to help me organize my life. Oh, man. <laughs> That's the, like organization is what makes me thrive. <laughs> we More married the same com- people. Today. Yeah, <laughs> it's like because it's compartmentalization. Yeah, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's almost like the point. If I know things are organized, I can allow myself to forget about them for a minute, and I can focus on creating. I can focus on writing because mm-hmm. I know that that will be taken care of later. Otherwise, I'm constantly juggling everything all the time, and I'm exhausted, and I have no headspace to make anything. You mm-hmm. know, totally. I think that I don't know when that switch flipped for me but I was like I can just put this in a box I'm gonna put this in a box and just open this box and just work in this drawer for a minute you Mm -hmm. know I mean maybe it was like a survival instinct because of some of the trauma that happens when you become a new parent yeah and also we were just like drowning trying to figure out how we were gonna keep doing what we're doing and like make these two worlds fit together yeah and like you we don't have parental child care proximal like Mm -hmm. there's not 
uh, there's we aren't near the family network that our ancestors depend on to juggle life and work balance and like there aren't very many bands where mom and daddy are both in the band it was some particularly unique conditions Mm. but so far it's just been an incredible adventure and it has forged us into something different than we were before it breaks you all the way down to your most primal self and then it's like the deep dark truthful mirror you're gonna face every day like all of your shortcomings are amplified and for me wrestling with some of that and wrestling with always wanting to be the best mother that you can be and also having to give yourself a break be like okay I'm just the okayest mom today, <laughs> yeah. but everybody's fed and healthy. And, and I asked them if they were having a good childhood today, and they both said yes. And they were not under duress when I asked them. <laughs> and I give myself a lot of grace yeah. when I don't necessarily rise to my own standards or what I project the s- social standards to be. Of yeah. Well, I think also historically and culturally, professional musicianship and touring musicianship has been designated for men and it's not a place culturally that's friendly to one women who are raising children at all but then also families and I mean that's what being on Kayamo is so cool because it's like there are more and more places that are nurturing of this and don't think your children our liability for your career. And that's another reason I like to talk about this stuff. And like, we don't post Georgia, we don't show her face a lot on our social media, but I've thought a lot about how much I want my social media and my like identity as a musician and sharing my music to be tied to my role as a mother. And I first had this self-conscious feeling that, oh, people are gonna think, oh, Michaela became a mom and now that's all she cares about. Mm -hmm. And she's not, you know, she's not relevant anymore as a musician. And then I was like, that's actually really fucked up and patriarchal and misogynistic. And so then it became important to me to show constantly, no, I can have both. And we're gonna keep working really hard to make sure that we have this life because I also wanna show little girls out there, it doesn't have to be a choice. You can grow up, and be a professional musician or an artist and be a mother. Because I have even friends in their 30s who are like, I don't know how I could keep touring or be a musician and have children, but I want that. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I'm gonna have to give up my career. Mm -hmm. So that's something I like to talk about a lot because there's still that mindset. And I've faced it also with my people that I've worked with in the professional realm of like, oh, you're having a baby? Yeah, that's, like, this is uh, gonna be that's hard. It for you, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't. Sp- obviously, I'm not a woman, but I can speak to the social media aspect of it, and like that just made me think of some things. We started this band not because we wanted. We didn't want to be like the husband and wife duo band who like looks at each other and is like, "Oh, we're a fucking rock band," you know. Mm-hmm. And we like to play loud, and we're like usually mad at each other when we're looking at each other. <laughs> that is a funny <laughs> truth, and we love each other so much. Like I love you so much. You're my soulmate. We're best friends, but also like. We are just people doing the best we can, and we're yeah. tired, and we're different as we could possibly be. And <laughs> I want boys, and he doesn't hand out just inauthentic praise just to make you feel good, to sprinkle little unnecessary stuff. He's loving, especially affectionate, like with kids, but like those kind of... Yeah, I'm, I'm bad at that. I'm working on that. It's just like one of those things that just never... And like my parents weren't that way, and mm-hmm. like my, my family wasn't too much that way. That way. <laughs> yeah, and so we... <laughs> Same. Very funny. Yeah. Is it this so, wild? Uh, yeah. You know, when we started this band, it started doing stuff and people were paying attention. And we kind of have always been like, don't pay too much attention to what they're saying because that doesn't do you any good. And we were already a little bit savvy by the time we started doing this. We had careers before and we had been in the you know biz. So we just sort of stuck to what we were doing and didn't really pay much attention then we start. we have kids now and i don't know we could be perceived as like oh look at now they have kids now this is the you know soft. carter family blah but yeah we're soft i know i think i um, think you're self-conscious about it am i showing my hand you're a showing bit? your hand babe <laughs> maybe so maybe so but i but like just as an artist and a musician and as a songwriter specifically we're not trying to lean on that we just decided that we were going to do it and we're like well we're gonna have kids 
we're gonna go on the road and we're gonna stay on the road and whatever happens happens and we just make the art and the music that we feel like making we've made them make places for our family we yeah. like we, well here's what how it went down like when we got pregnant we were at the t- top of our moment it was we were americana breakout yeah. or whatever and it was like our big moment to maybe rock it off and it was new year's eve morning we were playing a show with jason isabel in kentucky and we had the big talk with the managers with how big year that was coming up they left and literally five minutes later i called everybody back in and michael and i fessed up that we were going to have a baby and instead of being distraught or annoyed everybody was beside themselves with joy we're lucky in the sense that everybody in our infrastructure was a parent our booking agents were dads our publicists i mean it was just like everybody was rooting for us and also we're not that big of a if you're like a giant act and everybody's making millions of dollars on you. I think maybe there's more pressure for them to be negative Nancy's about your life. But we're like a low stakes band that everybody's rooting for. Mm-hmm. We're mom and pop shop. And I've never had a hard time, whether it's because I have a big personality or it can kind of walk in the masculine easily. Like I have always felt being a mother made me be perceived with more respect and tougher. And I'm a little big mama and I mother everybody and project my femininity sometimes presents as masculinity and that's always been an interesting thing because i remember feeling that way long before anybody started talking about gender fluidity or how we use gender and as a woman in this industry i mastered having masculine energy and projecting it in order to be able to have what i felt like equal footing Mm -hmm. along with the boys right so cursing drinking whiskey and trying to be a bit like one of the boys but also always held and treated with such respect and love by those boys that, including Michael, when we became partners, it was this interesting bounce. So my experience when we became parents was everyone rallied and supported us. And the space that we were taking up was easy to shape because the stakes were a little bit different. We were Mm -hmm. such a one paycheck, one thing. Mm -hmm. It's like we could get on a bus, for example. We were already on a bus for a year or two, I think, or right like a year before we got pregnant. And so having that bus in place was the secret weapon to us being able to bring the kids on tour and have a nanny and have it be super domestic out there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, also having said that, there's a lot of people who do it not in a bus. Mm -hmm. That's true. And who who do it gracefully and who make it happen and it works for them. That was kind of just like the path that we felt we could do it like with our skill sets and everything. Mm -hmm. We're like, we need to have a safe space where everybody can go. And you'll be able to bring the dog. I mean, we did. We had a, a baby, a dog, a mom and a dad, tour manager, a roadie tech, and a merch person, and a bus driver. And that yeah. was our, that's our life. I mean, that's when I met y'all when I was out with Indianola. Yeah. I think that was like 2016, mm-hmm. something Louis like that. Been like, a year Louis, old. Yeah, she was really young. And I right. remember, I mean, granted, we were chasing your bus in a rented Chevy Malibu. So mm-hmm. we'd show up a little bit later than you guys would. <laughs> but we'd show up and you guys would be getting back with your dog and with Louie in a stroller. And you're like, yeah, we just went for a walk here. And I was like, Damn, that's this is nice. This is a way to tour. Meanwhile, it's like me and Owen in this car. We're like eight cigarettes deep at this yeah. point. Like our backs all messed up. <laughs> and mm-hmm. like, oh, that seems like a great way to tour. Yeah, you know. And we're not on a bus, and we've taken Georgia on tour a bunch. And we're like, man, who would have known that stopping at a playground in some random town for like an hour is actually a really great way to tour? Get it's out really and like get some tour. sunshine and stretch your legs. And totally, yeah. Your perspective is different and it's healthier. There's so much hurry up and wait in this business. You have to show up so early to sound check and then you just sit around in a bar and no wonder everybody becomes an alcoholic yeah. who's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because there's shit else to do except for sit there and have a drink or like wander around and you need get a into hobby. trouble. You need yeah. a hobby. Whatever. Well, it's also... A Again, another part of this podcast for us is trying to show people that there's not one way to be a musician. Like I used to think if you were really organized, then you weren't really a creative. If you like, if you were good at math and spreadsheets, you weren't really an artist. And I always would combat that feeling and I would think, I guess I'm not really an artist because I'm interested or good at other things. And that's another thing that I think people fall into unhealthy habits because it's like, oh, you know, Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You're supposed to like go have fun and be wild, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what's interesting to us talking to different people. We interviewed the Milk Carton Kids and we did a tour with them when Georgia was like eight months old. And we, you know, 
the show ends and everybody leaves immediately and there's no late night hang. The mm-hmm. hang that we had was like going to an aquarium all together. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super dad. dad. Like, <laughs> Joey's like super dad, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. He shepherded yeah. us a little bit mm-hmm. in the early days. Joey did. We have a network and all the dads are talking, all the moms are talking to like coach each other and help each other along. Yeah, Carrie had a really great, I think she still has a great text thread going on between all of these different tour moms in all different kinds of bands. So we all, and they it's all had babies like at the same time. Full of mm-hmm. hacks, you know, like, mm-hmm. did you know that you can bring along like doggy duty bags and like throw a shitty diaper in there and tie it off and it won't stink up the whole bus? Yeah. <laughs> or if you Let have a known. dirty yeah. shower <laughs> in the dressing room of your rock club, if you just have a collapsible laundry, laundry basket, basket that you pop up, mm-hmm. you can also have a safe, clean place where your baby won't drown in the shower and you can wash them in a basket and there's just two inches of water for them to splash around in. Yeah. But then they'll catch you gone too because like one time, there's so many stories, one of the Indigo Girls mamas was like, do not make your babies homemade food and put that on the bus freezer because what happens is one night while the bus is being washed, the generator gets turned off and it loses temperature. Then it gets turned back on and then the baby's food is spoiled but you didn't know because the generator was off and you were asleep. Yeah. Right? So she's like, just forgive yourself and let's get you the squeezy bags and just do your best. And so yep. I stopped doing a lot of, I don't know, just there was tips, things to try, and then also pitfalls that you could fall into trying too hard to nail it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To appease the judgy moms. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. With a judgy mom inside you because you don't know what you're doing. You're just trying to figure out what kind of mommy you're going to be right. and what your boundaries are. And, you know, yeah. whether you're going to let them eat off the floor or not this time. Yeah. It's a daily question. We yeah. Or I just also... learning how resilient they actually are. I eat off the floor a lot now. Yeah. Me too. I'm <laughs> like, cool. Yeah. We all. Yeah. I've come to terms with that I'm a walking snot rag and napkin <laughs> at all times. At all yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah. And so. what you are going to eat is just the refuse of what they don't eat. Exactly. And that's, it's that's fine. Thing. It's, I would, it's easier clean you cooking up, two you meals know. yet yeah. at dinner time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm basically not ordering at restaurants anymore. Cool, I'll eat whatever everybody else doesn't eat. Yeah. You know, I wish somebody would have told me beforehand that as a new dad, I'm going to eat an hour later than I want to, standing up, and it's going to be cold. Yes, you're the garbage <laughs> man. Yeah, we all we we become the garbage man. Garbage man. man. Yeah. Here comes it. the garbage man. I'm going <laughs> to eat your food. No, I'll eat it. I'll eat it. <laughs> So you guys are talking about creating schedules for your independent creativity. What about creating together? Do you guys do that? Do you write your songs together ever? Or just is it a combination of it's combination. separate? We've never really gotten in a room been and like a session. two people on stools looking at each other with a guitar being like, yeah. okay, what you got? You know, let's write a song about this. We independently come up with ideas and scratch things down and sometimes write full songs before we share them with one another or sometimes it'll just be like I had an idea about writing a song like this what do you think and that'll just be the first seed I gave you like some line in French the other day you're like I need a French line that ends in this syllable sound and I gave it to you and I haven't even heard the melody but I was able to like co-write that moment but a lot of times we'll work separately and then when it's this is all part of the organization of it you know like oh it's time to make a record or we're gonna make a record in the coming months or whatever we have some serious sit down you know show me what you got i'll show you what i got from full songs fully flushed out songs to like the littlest ideas then we kind of pass them back and forth and sometimes we'll finish each other's stuff or sometimes one of us will just help out with a verse or a chorus or a melody or something. It's like, it's really always been kind of like that. And I think when we first started the band, maybe it was harder for us to do that together because mm-hmm. we were like, I'm in control. I need to be in control. And I was that way. And I also had a crush on you, which was like, I was like embarrassed to try to write with you. It was it's, too, it was like, I could never be, I was trying to land you, man. No. I, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't like go, like get that vulnerable with you. Like, uh, But now everything is really easy in that way. Like we're really wide open in that department and it's not. It's not precious at all. Mm-hmm. There's no embarrassment and there's no preciousness. I mean, we take that seriously and it's always a little bit like, I'm going to show you a little piece of my soul right now Mm -hmm. and just be kind, even if it sucks. We're pretty good with each other at locking in Mm -hmm. and being respectful of the sensitivities of each other. You know, that's a pretty intimate process, no matter who you're doing it with. It really is. I mean, we've been together for 15 years and our 
dynamic has been different because I mean the, the band name is Michaela Ann. You mm-hmm. know, we've always approached it that way with that separation that it's her band is her project and she hires me. I don't want her to feel any obligation to hire me to play music with her mm-hmm. if I'm not doing a great job, if I'm not the right fit. We've kind of always kept that. And we made her last record together. It was the first time we'd really worked that closely together, just the two of us making a record. And it, it's extremely vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You know, and she was pregnant at the time. We'd been married for, at that point, six... I mean, we'd been together yeah. for a long time. It was a long time. And still, the... I'll speak for myself, the insecurity. It's a really sensitive place, even though we have all this history together and mm-hmm. all this intimacy together. Something about creating together is a whole other level. Well, because it's so much more weighted when you know each other so deeply. Mm-hmm. And there can be then so much more tension. Like if I'm working with just a random person and they say something to me, I'm never like, well, what does that mean? And why do you say it like yeah. that? Yeah. Like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's no edge. It's not as emotional both ways, in a positive way and a negative way. That's cool to hear that you. Uh, it's gotten easier for you guys yes, over time. definitely. And even though we don't necessarily sit down in a writer's room in the Nashville tradition of co-writing, we've decided when we got married and when we started our band together, we would have a songwriting company like Lennon and McCartney, where mm-hmm. even if I write a whole song, our experience together is the song and sometimes all I do is give him a vote of confidence to be like no that is a good song I think this would be a better rhyme maybe here or I don't really like repeating that line over and over again but it's a good song and we can talk about it like technicians a little bit at that point you know we're like on both under the hood being like well is this the correct fitting you know it's not as personal yeah it's like with the thing that we're working on when it's precious but it's like our footing is just so much more solid now we have so much other <laughs> shit to worry about, you know? <laughs> so much Honestly. real shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we did, I mean, on the last record on Manticore, there's a song called Divide and I Conquer. I was just about to bring that sensitive subject up. <laughs> and it's a heavy song, and it's about two people. It's basically like, it's about two people, but it's not about us, but it is about us. Mm-hmm. And in this song, it's like... It sounds like a divorce song. Yeah. But it's not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the characters basically do what we do and then it gets too heavy and then they split and they split up the kids. And it- I was furious with Michael and I cried and I cried and I cried about it because I was just sure it was like, is this what you think we're going <laughs> to yeah, but I, then even I that song, it, we were able to just kind of, after I had a little cry, it wasn't like... I mean, we worked our way through it. Worked and we, our way through and, it. And, you know, the, all the things come through our heads. We're 10 years into our career, and we're like, oh, all these people are going to think that we are getting a divorce, you know? Mm-hmm. It's kind of become that way. <laughs> we have, have a happy you know? ending, Michael. Like, how do we even... <laughs> how do we even... What do we say... Before we play the song to assure the people that we're good. We're good. Yeah. We never song. play the song. And when we do, I do exactly that. I make a joke that mommy and daddy are fine. And none of this is your fault. Almost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was kind of good and necessary to write. It was coming from a pure place. And, it, you know, as artists, I feel like we work through our stuff in a real way. I mean, we're lucky to be able to work through our things through writing songs. And Mm -hmm. if it happens to make some people uncomfortable, then... It's just a story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Mm -hmm. a story of what if our thing went a different way? Or in this particular instance, we did kind of... There's a tie-up at the end. There's a tie-up and it's ambiguous, but it's hopeful at the end. It's not a presumption that all is lost. It says that you're stronger than you ever were before at the end of the song. And I would just be able to work out and talk about those feelings in a song and the insecurities, even with a really strong marriage, like how it could go terribly wrong and Mm -hmm. kind of facing it and then singing about it together, not divided. It's also kind of like I wanted to blow the idea out of people's minds that we were just elevated, perfect married couple that would never have a problem and never fight and goals couple goals kisser yeah. it's like that is not our bag we are deeply we do love each other but it's real and it's intense up here yeah. and there's a lot going on and mm-hmm. people want to project their mommy daddy stuff on us and now i'm wanted to be like yeah i'll be your mama i'm big little mama and i'm gonna tell you how it is it's hard sometimes yeah and you gotta like grow a pair it's of, of chi chis and cojones and grit down and bear it when it gets hard and then you find another little peaceful lull and you're stronger and better and more complete for having survived that. Yeah. Yeah, man, if you've 
five years ago or something like that, we were going through a time, you know, mm. uh, growing pains as a couple. It was just the constant push and pull all the time. When we were very much on the pull portion of our relationship. And I think it was a guy that came to fix our HVAC of all people. Mm-hmm. And he saw I had a wedding ring on. He was talking about it. He's like, oh, I've been married for 65 years. And he, I don't know how he got on it talking about fire. And he's like, you can't get gold without fire. You mm-hmm. got to send it through the flames and it comes out and it's pure and it's clean and it's stronger than ever. And stick it through this and it'll come out the other side and it'll be a little bit stronger and a little more worn in the best ways. You mm-hmm. know? I'm trying I to think about a way story. to write a song about old love like that. Like yeah. trying to think about my show in my hand now. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just thinking because there are love songs and I have written love songs and new in our relationship, especially all of my love songs are love songs for Michael. We're now we're writing love songs that are about the intensity of family and change and love songs for sinking ships and dying junkie whores and all kind of love songs for, you know, one-eyed salesmen and waitresses and circuses and all these wonderful characters. But I want to write another love song about an ode to loves that have survived and like... She mm-hmm. stopped loving him today. <laughs> 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 Is that about when you threw me off of the cruise ship? <laughs> <laughs> I was working on the chorus for that one. <laughs> he died at sea. He was well insured. <laughs> Charlie Rich has a great one that I think his wife wrote called Life Has Its Little Ups and Downs. But I think that there's so much shame around having hard times and ever having hard times in your relationship. And we talk about it that like there was a time that we separated and we took time apart and we thought maybe our marriage was over. And we've been together since we were 20, 21 years old. Like to think that anyone could go through their entire adulthood living in perfect harmony with one other person and there were never times that one or both people thought this is over and I have to get out of this they're lying if Mm -hmm. that's what they tell you and I feel like there's so much shame in what's just honest and true that it's really hard to build a life together and it's beautiful and incredible when you can survive the hard times but my parents my dad was a submarine captain and was out to sea half the year and we moved every other year and my parents have been there since they were 16 and my mom raised two kids moving to a new town and her husband couldn't communicate with him oh my God. that's just like the tip of the iceberg of what their relationship has stood the test of time and I feel like the best part of it is that my mom has always been like marriage fucking suck sometimes there are days that I wanted to run away and never come back there are days that I want to throw your father out the window Mm -hmm. like parenting is really lonely and boring and hard it's also the greatest thing I've ever done and the reason that I'm here on this earth she's always been so honest that life isn't about always feeling good every day and you're never going to and you want to find people who will stay and dig in and do the work. And so I think that's really incredible to share that more with people of like, yeah, this is incredible what we're building, that we're a band, we take our family on the road, we play our songs together, but that doesn't mean we're in perfect harmony every day. Yeah, We fight, we have sad times, we have times where we question what our future is, but that's not scary because we talk about it and we put it out there. Mm. What's the saying? The like mold grows in darkness. Yeah, mold grows in darkness. Yes, if you put it out in the open, shine some light on it. For me, you know, I used to struggle a lot with shame and all that. Mm -hmm. I used to think that vulnerability was a weakness. Yeah. And then I had some good friends that helped me turn that on its head. And it, it's amazing. Like, I just kind of voice something that I'm ashamed of. Even just with Michaela, it instantly kind of starts to feel better. And that starts to spread and it starts to heal itself in a way. I love yeah. that. Yeah. And art. I remember it has that incredible ability to do that for people. I think about like Lucinda Williams. Her songs are so exposing that sometimes you're like, what? She's sharing? And like if you dig a little deeper, it's probably a true story. Mm -hmm. But it makes you feel better about yourself because artists, through their vulnerability, through our vulnerability, we're giving others the permission to be vulnerable in return and know that none of us are unique. No, we're just little we're little primates just yeah. trying to figure out if we're going to be a bonobo or a silverback. Like, mm-hmm. like <laughs> are you going to be just a territorial beast? Are you going to be the, a loving, sex-happy, community-building ape? You know, yeah. what kind of monkey do you want to be yeah. with me? <laughs> mm-hmm. but, I mean, I don't know them, but Amanda Shires and I was, Jason Isbell. Girl, I was just about to say, Amanda's <laughs> record was the most vulnerable, crazy record. I was obsessed with the record, and I was kind of having a little 
feeling insecure in my not in my marriage but about whether my husband still liked me that week right Mm -hmm. and I was listening to her because she is telling all of her business all of this is real I can tell she has not written songs about somebody else's experience she is experiencing all of this and has the guts to share it with us and her husband stands there right next to her Mm -hmm. visibly supporting her and the same as what we're doing now like owning that all of our like this is not some gilded perfect thing and we're not perfect people and we'll have complicated relationships and the record that she made just besides the music and the songwriting this all of it blew me away but just the level that she just kind of owned what she was experiencing Mm -hmm. yeah because I'm sure there's people that think oh my god they're beautiful they have success their lives are perfect and I feel like they both do a really good job of being like I mean, I think it was around his record, too, that the press, they were saying like that he like went and lived in a hotel for a couple of weeks because they were having a hard time. And they seem very intentional about being like, yeah, we have problems, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we work through them. Don't give them the, the power to be like trouble in paradise. You know, yeah. you be like, fuck, yeah, there's trouble in paradise. You ever yeah. been alive? <laughs> yeah. Ever been alive before? <laughs> exactly. Life is hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For every yeah. single person that walks earth. My sister got on to me the other day because sometimes I can't. If we're in the airport and it's going badly and it's miserable and I'm like uncomfortable and really about to lose it and my anxiety is off and my hormones are from sweating and I'm Mm -hmm. like, are you hot? Oh God. (laughs) And then I have to say, at least we're not running from war-torn country right now. Like my sister's like, you don't have to be running from a war-torn country to have it be a miserable time. (laughs) You're entitled to this miserable. It's not one or the other. It's not one or the other. This effing sucks what's happening to us in this airport right now. And it's happening to all of us. And there's a thousand people in here and it's 200 degrees and nobody can get their luggage and the babies are crying. And it is happening to you. And it sucks and it's okay to be like. Have a little meltdown. (laughs) Have your little meltdown. And on the other side, it's going to be two cold care ribs and a Think of French fries at the airport hot dog stand yeah. to fix everything. <laughs> you know, how quickly things can change. Um, yeah, I had some pigs in the blanket the other night sitting up here in the artist lounge, and that fixed a lot. I'm yeah. like, this is great. These are the best things I've ever eaten. <laughs> Said about 10 times in a row. <laughs> going to be I looking forward. I, I yeah. had that same meltdown at Christmas at the airport, and I was like, yeah. I'm throwing these pants away. I'm so fucking hot. And Aaron was like, can you just take? But sometimes you have to just let it out. Mm-hmm. You have to throw mm-hmm. a little fit. <laughs> And I always say I'm sorry, and I'm always kind to the staff, no matter how awful I'm being on the inside, because I respect humanity, and I understand what they have to endure. But sometimes they can be very cold. Yeah. It makes you, I just get my hormones flush, and I just start to sweat, and I feel so hot. Like Pedro traveling. from, <laughs> from, uh, from uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> my, my Pedro moment where I'm going to shave my hair in the airport. Air travel is a, it's a thing with kids. Oh, my God. Oh, man. I don't say anything about it. They might have to, and I don't want to do anything to discourage. Enough. I will say we were, we were waiting at the airport in Nashville. There was a family in front of us, and they had like one kid was like five. One kid was prime toddler, probably two and a half, three. Mm-hmm. And they had another baby on the shoulder, you know, burp cloth, all that. And they were having a time. And mm-hmm. right then I told them, Michaela, and I was like, we're not going to be unnumbered. I'm like, two is cool. We are not going with three. More power to people that can do it, but that is not our yeah, you situation. You can't sit in the same row at that point. Like, exactly. yeah, logistically, you have to bring somebody when you fly because there's just going to be. Yeah, on the flight to St. Martin or whatever to meet up with this boat, they split us up. So I had Oscar and she had Louie. And Oz was in the middle. And there was a stranger in the aisle and I was on the window. And then eventually he's going to need to lay down. So that means that either his head or his feet are going to get up in the stranger's business, yeah. like in his lap somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I used to care a little bit more or used to be like, oh, no, you know, I mean, I still sweated a little bit. Like I try to scoot him as much as I can. But at some point, you know, you got to meet eyes with that guy and be like, eh? <laughs> 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 so to describe Michael's face, eyebrows raised <laughs> yeah. in curiosity of acceptance. Is this OK with you? Then? There's nothing I can really do. So I mean, yeah. This is happening. This so. is happening to you and there's I nothing. Hope we can th- do. I hope this is OK for you. Because I'm this, not going to do anything about nothing it. Nothing I can really do, you know, but I did switch the other side once or twice the guy was cool i feel like in most cases the person everybody like gives loves the humans kid. the benefit of the doubt yeah. and to be a, like able so to cute. rise to the thing you know like people want to be nice yes yeah and you should have headphones on an airplane 
just no matter what. You should have. You should have brought your own yes. headphones at this point in the game. Yes, yeah. I agree. So if there's a crying... Got an iPhone or some kind of Galaxy. Some If you have a screen, you have the headphones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have a question about how long you guys have been in the music business. Obviously, promotion has changed and social mm-hmm. media now is like a main driver of promoting even more than like having an entire marketing department. That means nothing. It's really like artists, what can you do on social media? How do you guys, especially with having two people in the mix of having to deal with it, do you hate it? Do you like it? What's your relationship to it and how do you figure it out? We have two different relationships with it. I am active but resistant and I curate, but I'm, I do scroll mm-hmm. and I do participate a certain degree in the social media world and I, I don't despise it entirely because I'm of a certain age and I can mediate my use, but we are going to accept that we have to adapt to marketing strategies throughout the eons. It's just another creative tool that you can use if you use it with intention. And we are about to expand into doing more of it without necessarily feeling gross about it or feeling like it needs to take up a whole lot of our time. And management is going to help facilitate that just because we need to do more of it, no matter what we feel about it one way or the other. Yeah, But it does need to be good. And it does need to be a real engagement that you'd want to do otherwise. Yeah, you can go about it methodically. Never did we think that we would be hearing from the record label, you guys really need to be on TikTok. And maybe we don't need to hire a publicist anymore. (laughs) Yeah. 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 You know, like the business (laughs) has changed so much and we've always been like, let's write songs and make records and tour. And that's what you do, right? Mm -hmm. To do the thing. And now it's different. And if you don't adapt with it, you're going to take a hit just because it's the way that the whole thing operates right now. I kind of despise it, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's not what I think about. I never think about doing it. I feel like there's some sense of when you're younger, when you're first getting going, I think you're ego kind of drives you in a way that's a little bit dangerous it's like too much in control Mm -hmm. but it has to be there to push you through the like some of the those moments of course i'm a rock star yeah you like have to i don't know it's (laughs) weird wanting to achieve more yeah it drives you and then now it's like i never think oh you know it'd be fun i want to get on tiktok and make a video of myself Mm -hmm. like it's the last thing Thing i want to do that i'm thinking about and if i do think about it i'm like oh i need to do that for work You know, it's not, there's not a part of my ego that's like, I need people to see me do this dance move. Right. Because they need to (laughs) witness this. This is what they're missing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Everybody's missing out. Yeah. I need to share. Yeah. But slow-mo squirrel scares. Don't give it, don't. I'm showing. Don't. don't, don't, don't. (laughs) Because there's things that you can make that you just make automatically that you realize like that is actually brilliant content. And I won't disclose further what is slow-mo squirrel scares. I bet you can figure it out. Is that going to be part of your... Maybe. I mean, we got to find stuff to do. So maybe if I feel like filming a squirrel on my porch in slow motion while I open the door and yell at it... (laughs) It's something that maybe will show up. I don't know. Maybe Michael has hundreds of videos of him scaring squirrels in slow motion on the front porch. (laughs) Maybe not hundreds, but... Well, I heard that you can embed your music in TikTok. This is like something I didn't know. I just got debriefed about TikTok because we're not on it, but we're going to be on it. Uh But we're probably going to make stuff and then send it to our manager and have him put it up. Right. Because I can't handle it. Also, it's like your kid needs something and you're like, hold on. Dad's got the bathroom door locked and I'm doing a dance (laughs) for for TikTok. (laughs) Doing my work. I'm busy. <laughs> Serious business. I'm going to get Louie to be our creative director for TikTok. Yeah. It might go far. I look at TikTok and I feel like my eyes cross. I'm like, what is going on I, here? What I works? honestly downloaded the app recently, like the first time I ever looked at it. And there was like a terrifying video that it suggested to me right off the bat about like a camera in a shower, someone trying to catch a partner doing something bad to their chat. And I was just like, oh my God. no. And I deleted it immediately. Mm-hmm. I was like, clearly I don't know how to do it because I shouldn't be seeing those things. Mm-hmm. And I just, I can't, I like look at Instagram and Twitter too much as it is. Mm-hmm. And I can't add one more thing into the mix. Can you just yeah. connect them all? I mean, we're going to sound like, let's have an old person conversation. Let's talk about it, old people. <laughs> Come on, elder millennials. Yeah. Let's get it out. Is there a button we can push that connects all the things it together? It does. There was an app called like Hootsuite. I'm sure there's others where you could just put it in the app and then it'll go to the others. 
all of them. Uh huh. But now all the formatting's a little different. But now you just make a reel or you make a TikTok and you just put that on Instagram. Mm. I'm going to figure it out. I've got people who are good at social media who I consult and I will pursue this We're but also have a healthy situation because yeah. I'm not going to put on a bunch of stupid garbage on TikTok. Like maybe I'll cook something nice, do a little gardening. Ooh, thing, just like I would something. like to watch those. So my mother's a TikTok junkie. Really? Real bad. And she's even admitted it. She's a social media junkie anyway, but she will straight up be like, in my retirement, I just TikTok now. And she doesn't make videos. She just consumes videos. Yeah. And mostly it's garden TikTok, cleaning TikTok, only things that she's specifically interested in. But it is still just like she's just scrolling. Yeah. She's scrolling. She's just being, she can spend hours and hours and she's learning. And it's not all necessarily bad as opposed to the Facebook vibe where it's like we'd start talking about people that we don't necessarily know or Really, I don't have any real estate in my life or any of the tertiary groups of my surrounding ancestors or whatever and hey, friends. It's Aaron from high school. I didn't mean that. I, I just picked Aaron as like a name out of the hat. You know, you know what yeah. I mean. I know what you're it's saying. Like, yeah. Well, that happened a- to Michaela the other day. She was scrolling and somebody posted this horrific thing about like their brother taking their life. And it's like a pretty graphic, detailed post. And Michaela's like, who is this person? And we have like a bunch of mutual friends in Nashville, but like, I'd never seen the person, didn't know the person's name, and same with her. And it's like, why am I being exposed to I'm this? I'm grieving this person. There? I don't even Yeah, it's yeah, a lot exactly. of like snap emotional, like the emotional journey that I go on within five minutes of scrolling is so wild. It's like, got to be weird for our dopamine. It's, it's definitely bad. not yeah. good for our brains. Yeah. It's not. When we got off on, because we've been on the boat for a few days before you guys and didn't have Wi-Fi that was working, so I haven't scrolled anything. And I'm like, wow, I feel so content Mm -hmm. and like peaceful. And then we got off the island and I started scrolling and like nothing triggered me. Like I didn't see anything specifically, but it was all of a sudden this creeping feeling of like, is my life good enough? Am I doing enough? And I was like, what is happening? Like I haven't even seen anything specifically that made me feel jealous. And I'm literally on a beach in St. Martin with my family getting paid to play music and go on vacation. And I open this little app and all of a sudden I start feeling anxiety and like inferiority. And I was like, this is not okay. That's what's <laughs> happening to the kids. Yeah. And that's, I don't want to be the adult that's like the kids these days. Cause it's not that it's like, I think that they know what's happening to them now. And maybe there's going to be a youth revolution or some kind of reinterpretation or they'll adapt to the way that they're digesting this media because they will have come up with it. We all remember when there was no screens at all. And no yeah. internet at all. And phone lines were in your house. And Yeah, you got to call and talk line. to somebody's dad to get her on the phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we tried to make a joke to the kids today. What's black and white and red all over? A newspaper. Trying to teach the kids dumb jokes. They don't know what a newspaper is. Yeah. Right. It's such a bizarre thing. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I get that too. Because I, I love the artist community. And I love having friends in the mix. So I follow a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And then when we weren't on the road. If somebody was on the road, I would feel the jealousy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I would wonder, am I losing my place in the, and you also remember there's enough pie for everybody, especially when you get on a boat like this, an infinite amount of love in the world for art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's not like you only have room for 10 bands in your heart, right? Yeah. But the things that you love can even affect you in a negative way. And the people that you support and believe in and who are your friends would never want you to feel less because you're not at work. Meanwhile, you're at work raising the two cutest little boogers that ever walked the earth yes. at your house. <laughs> and all they want to do is play Mario Kart with you. So who cares yeah. about what's going on on the thingamajiggy, but it affects adults. And I can't imagine how it's affecting the kids. And I hope that they can figure out how to rise above it and like mm-hmm. rebel against it in some way, the way that we did to like smoking and racism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. exactly. Like we don't even mince words about racism yeah. anymore. Yeah, I hope we all come to a place where we're able to see social media for what it is, which is just a big marketing tool, essentially. They for told us, us as, that like, it was. As small business, businesses, <laughs> but also like, for them you know it's like what's the saying about any kind of app or website like if you don't pay for it you are the product yeah mm-hmm. you know what i mean it's like in our attention span is the product making facebook or meta or whatever it's called now billions of dollars yes so the algorithm is there to give us stuff that keeps our attention the longest so i think me as a human i am susceptible to that all the time of the jealousy and the comparison and the even though i know in my head this is somebody just like me this is just a friend that has to post this because they have their business that they need people to hear it's about just to working to these shows. 
yeah. it's just working. And they want the same things that we want. Yeah. And they also deal with jealousy. We all feel the best when we're making the thing, you know, yeah. when mm-hmm. we're just at work, digging out our soul a little bit, being inspired. I don't know. The sites aren't the place for inspiration. You know, right. that's mm-hmm. the place where you feel like you're not good enough. And then you spend less time there. And I'm not saying that we're any better than anybody else, but it is true that if it's down and you're working on the thing, then you feel better. And that's what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. We have to wrap because you guys have to go play a show. But I have one last question. I was wondering how your definition and idea of what a successful music career for yourselves has evolved and changed from the beginning to now. I'm going to make a short answer because I tend to be verbose. At a time when I was young, when I was really, really young, I thought you had to be a big star to be a musician. Then I became a bar musician, a working musician who could count on $100 a night for a three-hour gig and have my meal comped. And to me, that was success. But I knew I still wanted to be playing for a 1,000 people or whatever. And then it's grown, and I've, now I've got a wonderful music career where I can play in 200 or 1,000 or whatever here and there. But I know that I would be probably just as happy if it had been different. Like having a successful career in music is getting paid to make some noise and being able to have the freedom, even if you have some other job that allows you to just play some music for your soul, that is a successful music career. There's not a dollar sign on it, and there's definitely not a time frame. Mary Gaucher started writing songs in her 40s, right? Mm-hmm. And she makes everybody cry when she plays She's incredible. Crap. Yeah. Like, so I think that it's just kind of whatever it is to you, but if you have the joy in your life of music and you're lucky enough to make a dollar doing it, then you're nailing it. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, in the beginning, I always just wanted to be able to do it and make a living doing it and not have to have another job. Didn't really care otherwise. That was the main thing. You know, when we started this thing, we were a bar band and it was a joke. I mean, it was like fun, but also... We were literally joking. It was, you know, <laughs> caught on, stuff happened. Now... I feel like balance is what I would consider a successful music career. Like, we're always sort of trying to achieve balance. Like, you can't be on the road too much, but you don't get paid unless you're on the road because music is free now. But if you're on the road too much, you're going to kill yourself or your mind will become unhealthy. Like, I can tell when we're on the road for too many days and we're like, man, I'm really feeling the show that it's too important in my mind because the whole day revolves around a show like yes it's important and it's the job and people pay money to come and see you but you can't take up that much real estate in my mind you know mm-hmm. it's not that important it's just rock and roll you know mm-hmm. and so i don't know i hope the business can morph a little bit into something where it's more open where artists can get paid for making the stuff and not just hustling and jiving. Stuff. yeah because mm-hmm. especially through covid there's a lot of stories of People just throwing up their hands and being like, I cannot do this anymore. And these are people that you really wish that they would do it some more, you know, or at least like create more because it feeds people's souls and inspiration and everything. Yeah, I I agree. I like to think of it as like little bubbles kind of floating around. And I have my personal bubble. I have my family bubble and I have like my career bubble. As long as I can kind of keep those the same size and jostling around up there, Mm -hmm. I feel the best call that a success because there's been times when one has been way bigger than the other or one has been way smaller than the other and it just doesn't feel right and the wheel stops spinning for me Mm, at that point all around yeah I think a lot of us start out also when you're younger your career takes up everything oh yeah and then you're like wait I'm supposed to sacrifice my entire personal life for this thing that there's no guarantee that it's going to return anything to me Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a gamble. Yeah. So that beauty of like learning that there's more to life than just that. Michael, you said before we started talking, you were ready to get going because we could do this every week kind of thing. I do feel like like Like, we should just tonight, let's just get together again and we'll just talk some more. I feel like we need to talk to you. Some more. Just to let. We'll go now, but let's reconvene later. Okay. Yeah. Cool. (laughs) Thank you, guys. Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours podcast. You can find more info on this episode, including links to things that we talked about by going to theother22hours.com and clicking on episodes. We want this show to be a resource for our community from our community. So we'd love to hear from you about what works and what doesn't. Please let us know by sending an email to info at theother22hours.com. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode.